Wait, I'm confused. I thought, was Talladega still the last race of the round? Because I think I remember somebody almost flipped. How's it going everybody? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. Oh boy, a lot to talk about. There's a lot to process after the fallout from Kansas. So I'm not going to waste your time. I'm not going to waste my time. Let's just, let's jump right into it guys. So new this year, Kansas Speedway was the third and final race of the round of 12. NASCAR made this decision mainly because people were complaining that Talladega was the last race and Talladega, we all know how much of a wild card that is. A lot of stuff can happen without you uh, having anything to do with it. So they didn't want that to be the deciding the final race of a round. They thought that created too much confusion, which was definitely a good move, but I don't think they saw uh, the kind of craziness that happened this weekend. I don't think they saw that coming. So for starters, I'll start with the not super shocking news. Uh, Martin Truex Jr. won his seventh race of the year. That is a lot of wins. He overcame a loose wheel, he got a restart violation, and he still came back to win. And it turns out when you add the five bonus points he gets from this win, he goes into the round of eight already with a 50 two point cushion over the elimination cut line. He's already got more than a whole race worth of points, well, maybe discounting the stages, but he's already got a 52 point lead and we haven't even started Martinsville yet. But hey, you can't say he hasn't earned it. Seven wins, uh, countless stage wins, dude's just racking up points, man. The race did not go nearly as smoothly for some other championship contenders, so I guess we could, we should probably talk about some of the more surprising occurrences. For starters, we have to talk about Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson has officially had a breakout year. He's won the second most amount of races in the series behind Truex. Uh, he's run top three in points almost all year. Uh, in many people's cases, they believed he, him to be a true championship contender, and a lot of people, including myself, were excited to see what he could do at Homestead should he make it that far. But Sunday at Kansas was not his day. Kyle Larson, fairly early on in the race, suffered an engine failure, went up in smoke, had to go behind the wall. His day was done. He finished 39th. Now, despite the fact that Larson came in with a 29-point cushion over the cut line, uh, that was not enough. So unfortunately, Kyle Larson was eliminated and eliminated far earlier than most all of us probably expected. And it really sucks for Kyle Larson because an engine failure, there's not a lot that the team could do. There's not a lot of anything that the driver could have done to prevent that. Just sometimes something like that happens and it uh, goes boom. We don't see many engine failures in the Cup Series these days and that only makes it hurt worse, I'm sure, for Kyle Larson, his team, and his fans knowing that just kind of such a fluke incident like this came at the worst possible time for that team. Uh, he'll definitely be back strong next year though. I don't think there's much doubt there. And like I said, it's a shame because a lot of people, including myself, had Larson getting all the way to Homestead and it would have been a real, I think it would have been a very exciting race to see how Truex, who's been probably the best car all year long, could battle with Kyle Larson, who's very good at Homestead. That was definitely gonna probably make a pretty interesting championship battle, but now it looks like Martin Truex Jr. might be the runaway favorite. And I know people are gonna criticize the playoff format for having uh, the system in such a way where a bad right race like that can eliminate a guy like Larson who's been so good this year. But people forget, under the old chase format, and I'm talking about the original 10 races, most points at the end wins, the kind of format we basically had from like 2004 to like 2013, basically that format. Under that format, you could realistically maybe have one bad race and still have a shot at the championship. Even under that format, you had more than one race where you finished outside the top 20 or had a DNF especially, you really were already out of championship form. The champion those years typically was consistently, you know, in the running, in the top 10, in the top five, all throughout the playoffs. And see Kyle Larson, he wrecked at Talladega, still got a 13th place finish, but a 10th place finish at Charlotte, which is subpar, it's not good enough to be a round of eight driver. And then of course this wreck, or not this wreck, this blown engine at Kansas. You know, he had three, he had two not so great races, and then one obviously catastrophic race. So it's really hard to say that this one race ended his playoff hopes entirely. Remember, he still had a 29-point cushion coming into Kansas despite those mediocre finishes at, at Charlotte and Talladega. He still had a 29-point cushion, and that's because he's racked up so many bonus points from wins and stage wins earlier this year. So in that case, I think the playoff format almost saved him despite such a bad round. I'll tell you guys, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I think the current playoff format with the round-by-round -round system is almost perfect. I think the way that bonus points from the wins in the regular season and stage points carry over round-by-round, -round, I think that's a great idea. It's the equivalent, I'd say, to like home field advantage being given to the best team with a better record in baseball or football. The one thing I hate about, and I've said before, is the win and you're in that happens during the regular season. That's a stupid rule. Needs to be gone, but that's irrelevant to this point. I guess to finish up about Kyle Larson, that had to be just a real, real heartbreaking moment for, all of, assume all of his fans, uh, his team, obviously his crew, everyone, on, everyone involved with the 42 car. That had to be 
a really just a shocking moment because like I said, they've run pretty well all season long, one of the best all season long. They've had a decent playoff so far, seem poised to make it to the round of eight and have a decent shot to go to Homestead with a chance at the championship. And those have all literally, no pun intended, they have gone up in smoke. Now the playoff drama did not stop there. No, there was a key incident uh, with about 70 laps to go into the, into the beginning of stage number three. There was a key incident on a restart that really shook things up uh, dramatically. On that restart, Eric Jones, who was up in the top five, got loose coming out of turn two, spun up the racetrack, was clobbered by Daniel Suarez, Jamie McMurray made contact, and then a bunch of other drivers in the field, including several playoff drivers, just spun, scrambling, trying to avoid the wreck as they went down the backstretch. It was a nasty wreck. Jones's car got up sideways for a moment. You know, the front ends of Suarez and McMurray's cars were completely destroyed. But more importantly, looking at the playoff picture, some playoff drivers were uh, majorly affected. Well, for one, there was McMurray, who is a playoff driver and was horribly destroyed in that wreck, but McMurray came into the weekend, weekend, you know, so far behind he needed to win, and that clearly did not look like it was going to happen with the speed they were having, so, you know, there wasn't a huge shakeup there. The bigger shakeup was with Matt Kenseth. Matt Kenseth was involved in the wreck pretty minorly, he got hit from behind while he was trying to avoid, spun, suffered a little bit of damage here and there, but the car was not in horrible shape. Matt Kenseth came into the weekend at Kansas eight points back. He was in 10th place. Him and Kyle Busch were both right there, seven, eight points back from the cut line. And with, at that point, Kyle Larson had already had major struggles in the race, was out, looked like he was going to miss the playoffs. That was one spot Kenseth had bumped up to ninth. And then with Jimmy Johnson, who I'll talk about more in a little bit, had some issues, was running further back in the pack. Matt Kenseth, for a pretty decent amount of time there, looked like he was going to nab that eighth spot. But with this incident, stuff got tense. And unfortunately for Matt Kenseth, when the team went into pit to repair some of the damage, they mistakenly sent a seventh person over the wall. And now that right there was not a violation. It was when the seventh person then inexplicably didn't mean to, went over and started working on the race car. Now that's always been a penalty in NASCAR when you have too many men over the wall, but in the past, whenever people had too many men over the wall, typically to work on repairing damage, uh, the penalty was only you'd start at the tail end of the longest line. And historically, most teams would look at that and say, hey, we're probably gonna start near the back anyways because we had to pit for damage. Uh, might as well get that extra guy over here. What's the harm? Just a few extra spots, not a big deal. That used to be the rule, but you guys remember this year, they introduced the crash clock or the wreck damage clock where teams have five minutes to repair a car after it suffers wreck damage. And if they can out, repair the car and get it up to minimum speed uh, in those five minutes then they are out well with that new rule introduction apparently a new rule was introduced where if a, if a seventh person comes over the wall and works on the car uh, that car will automatically be impounded it will be disqualified from the race automatically and so that happened to Matt Kenseth with a car that still was drivable still had only made minor repairs with this seventh crew member touching the car a little bit with his dirty little fingers uh, that car was disqualified from the race. Still in the lead lap, still looked like it was gonna be competitive. The car had been running top three, top five all day long. Still in the middle of a playoff championship hunt. Uh, they were disqualified and just forced to pull it behind the wall. As a fan of NASCAR and of course of Matt Kenseth, this was excruciatingly frustrating to watch. And I want to start with this. I get that it's in the rule book. Jason Ratcliffe, the crew chief, knew it was in the rule book and was actually trying to get one of his crew members to not do what he did, but he did anyways. They knew the rules. They knew the penalty if they broke the rules, and they broke the rules. So I don't have a problem with NASCAR really enforcing the penalty. My problem is with why the hell does NASCAR have this penalty like that at all? Why does NASCAR have a penalty that allows for a scenario like what happened to Matt Kenseth this weekend? Why do they have a penalty that allows something like that to happen? Because like I said, Matt Kenseth's car in the middle of a championship, it was going to go down to the wire between him and Johnson. Both at that point had slightly damaged race cars. It was going to go down to the wire with who got that last spot. Why do we have a rule that prevented that from happening? Because if you ask me, a rule where a guy just maybe puts his hand on the car, makes very little changes to it, ultimately results in the car being disqualified, that seems like a stupid rule. Why did we even bother changing it? That's not a super major infraction. That's not a super duper big deal. Why don't we just send the car to the tail end of the longest line like we always did? Who changed that rule? Anyway, my point is not to harp on the rule too bad. It's really unfortunate because Matt Kenseth uh, had a good car at Kansas. Like I said, was running top three, top five, did well in the stages for the most part, had made up points on Johnson. They were both neck and neck when Johnson had a couple of spins. Uh, then Kenseth obviously had his incident, which kind of put him back further behind. Obviously, Kenseth with the DNF uh, did not make it in. He was also eliminated. But it's frustrating for me as a NASCAR fan because Matt Kenseth is probably going to retire after this season. And so that means Kansas was really his last race of his career that's going to be meaningful, really. But you know what? As a Matt Kenseth fan, I'm just going to rant for a moment here. Uh, I'm perfectly okay with him retiring at this point because 
it kind of is the, a fitting end to what's been just an excruciating couple of years to be a Matt Kenseth fan. It's the exclamation point on what it feels like has been NASCAR trying to throw him out of the sport for several years now. I mean, think back to 2015 at Kansas. We all remember the Logano Kenseth incident. It started at Kansas when racing for the win, Logano spun Kenseth out, and ultimately that led to Kenseth being eliminated from the playoffs in that round. Joey Logano didn't show any remorse, but more importantly, the CEO of NASCAR, Brian France, came out in support of Logano, saying that what Logano did was a smart move to take out a championship threat like Matt Kenseth. Those are specifically his words. He called it quintessential NASCAR that Joey Logano took out Matt Kenseth racing for the win. So the incident itself, along with those words from both Logano and Brian freaking France, is mainly what led to Matt Kenseth two weeks later retaliating at Martinsville. We've all seen the clips. Matt Kenseth destroyed Joey Logano's car in that race and ultimately Joey Logano's playoff hopes. And as a result, NASCAR obviously took action. But NASCAR that year decided to hand Matt Kenseth a penalty that was so heavy, it was unprecedented. They decided to suspend Matt Kenseth for the next two races, just straight up suspend him. This was unprecedented. This is, I believe, the first time a driver had been suspended multiple races like that for an incident that happened during the cup rate, during a cup race itself. And this is despite the fact that the majority of fans that were at the race, that watched the race, loved what Matt Kenseth did. I mean, videos on YouTube, hundreds of thousand views, tons of engagement. People thought it was great. But NASCAR still suspended Matt Kenseth, even though three years earlier, Jeff Gordon had did the, done the exact same thing to Clint Boyer. Clint Boyer was racing for the championship, was second in points at Phoenix, the second to last race of the year, when he and Jeff Gordon made contact, Gordon got wrecked. Instead of, you know, handling it afterwards, Jeff Gordon went back out on the racetrack and just took out in an equally violent crash to what Kenseth and Logano were involved in, just took out Clint Boyer. NASCAR did not suspend Golden Boy Jeff Gordon. No, 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 that would have hurt ratings. So I'm only bitter because I guess Jeff Gordon, he's really famous. Jeff Gordon sells tickets. Matt Kenseth does not sell nearly as many tickets as Jeff Gordon, but I was pissed because it's not right to treat a guy like that. NASCAR treated Matt Kenseth poorly in that incident, and I have still not forgiven him for that. I'll be honest, I'm still bitter about that. I still wear the shirt because I'm so bitter about that. And of course, we can't forget the race at Richmond earlier this year when an ambulance was parked on pit road during caution pit stops, and that caused several cars to run into each other, including Matt Kenseth, destroyed his radiator. And rather than accept any blame for the incident, NASCAR decided to go and put Matt Kenseth on the five minute crash clock for an in-race incident, and that team was not able to re repair a whole radiator and replace a radiator in that five minutes, so they were effectively DNF'd. And that incident almost knocked Matt Kenseth out of the playoffs completely before they even started. And now there's incident, which granted was Matt Kenseth's team's fault. However, it's still frustrating to me that NASCAR still seems to kind of pick which penalties they're going to enforce. Remember when Jimmy Johnson pitted outside of his box a couple weeks ago at Talladega, but NASCAR decided not to penalize him because they saw not having all five lug nuts on that tire as a safety issue? You tell me what's more unsafe. A crew member on his knees servicing the car outside of his pit box on a hot, busy pit road, or a tire out there that doesn't have all five lug nuts but only has four. It's stupid, NASCAR. I can't wait for this season to be over because I, I kind of want Matt Kenseth to retire. He's just taken the high road in all these incidences has let NASCAR walk all over him for several years in a row now. And he has just let him do it. To be honest, he's taken the high road every single time. You know, even in his post-race interviews, he doesn't call anyone out. He doesn't get mad. He shows us, uh, puts on a good face for himself and his sponsors, which is one of the reasons Matt Kenseth is my favorite driver and has been for more than a decade now. So I just don't really want him to have to endure the silliness that is NASCAR these days with some of the rules, with some of the ways they enforce things, with some of the incidences that just straight up happen on the racetrack nowadays. I don't know, if Matt Kenseth wants to leave, I'd say, please leave. I don't want you... I don't want to watch you get destroyed by these people anymore. But anyway, that's my rant. Thanks for listening to that. Even if you're not a Kenseth fan, I appreciate you listening to that. Moving back to the playoff contenders and how they did in the race. Jimmy Johnson, I was, I've was alluded to it already, had an eventful day. He came into the playoffs only seven points ahead. I said that it would be on the edge. I actually picked Jimmy Johnson to miss and get eliminated in this round. And while he seemed to have a decent car early on, he spun out twice and actually had a little bit of damage after that. And things were not looking good for him. Until, of course, the Matt Kenseth penalty basically saved Jimmy Johnson. Because without that, even with Larson's having his issues. Kyle Busch ran so well. Uh, Brian Blaney ran really well. Jimmy Johnson was going to be on the outside looking in, but the incident with Matt Kenseth and the big wreck on that restart got Jimmy in. He finished 11th, which given with the way his car was, that's impressive. But he definitely limps into the round of eight. I want to dedicate part of this last bit of the show to Ryan Blaney, because I got to say, I was very impressed with his performance on Sunday. I hadn't talked about Ryan Blaney much in these playoffs until last week's episode when he was right there near the cut line. He went in seventh in points. He was, I believe, 
uh, nine points ahead of the cut line going into last week, so he was on the bubble but looked like to be in a decent position. I picked Blaney to be eliminated after Kansas because I did not see them being able to turn on the speed the way they had it earlier in the season. I saw Blaney running 10th to 15th and just missing out by a little bit. And after qualifying on Friday when they failed post-qualifying inspection and were told they were going to have to start last, my prediction was feeling pretty good. But they came out on Saturday, showed great speeds in practice, came out on Sunday, started last, drove into the top 15 easily, used strategy to get up into the top five, and then they really never left the top five the rest of the race. Clearly had speed, not quite winning speed, not good enough to win, but top five speed, and that is, I had to say, I was very impressed. It's a single car team, you know, it's not Hendrick, it's not Gibbs, it's not Penske, it's a single car Wood Brothers team with a young driver in only his second full season, and they pulled off a clutch performance. <coughs> oh, sorry, I'm losing my voice. So anyway, I just wanted to shout him out good there. Impressive performance for Blaney. He's now earning my dark horse considerations, at least, to make it all the way to Homestead. And of course, the one other big playoff bubble driver coming into Kansas that I have not really yet talked about was Kyle Busch. Now, he came out right away, qualified well, ran really well, dominated the early portion of the race, looked like he was unbeatable. He ultimately was only barely able to hang on to a top 10 finish, but still, especially with Kyle Larson's issues and Matt Kenseth's issues and Jimmy Johnson having a great race, uh, Kyle Busch, uh, that was more than good enough to get him into the round of eight. So Kyle Busch is moving on. Talk about how big of an upset that would have been if both Kyle Larson and Kyle Busch were eliminated at Kansas. My goodness, I think everyone, and I mean everyone's bracket was going to be broken then. It was a wild day for a lot of playoff contenders. It was, nobody really felt safe. And I'm sure NASCAR, when they decided to move the Talladega race from this spot and move it to the middle and move Kansas to the last race in this round, I'm sure they weren't quite expecting what we got on Sunday. But hey, what can I say? It was fairly pretty entertaining. You never knew exactly what was going to happen or what was going to go wrong. As heartbreaking as it was to see Larson get eliminated and Kenseth get eliminated, uh... The race was still good, so I'll give him props for that. Now, there weren't a whole lot of big news stories that came out this week, but there was one pretty notable one. Richard Petty Motorsports, this was hinted at a while back, they confirmed that Daryl Wallace Jr. will be driving the 43 car next year in the Cup Series. Didn't announce a sponsor or anything, they just said what I just said. And if you ask me, this is a pretty smart move for Richard Petty Motorsports. You know, while Daryl Wallace Jr., there's a lot of question marks around him because he has not been that successful in his career. He's done well in the Truck Series, but he doesn't even have an Xfinity Series win. Now, part of that, you could argue he's, driving, he's been driving for Roush his whole career. And now, while Roush's expanded program has still been okay, their cup program has definitely fallen off a cliff. So you could just argue maybe his equipment wasn't great. But nonetheless, I think he proved that he is capable of running at the Cup Series when he subbed for Almirola a few races earlier in the season. But still, a decent amount of question marks. I think it was a good move, though, because I think NASCAR needs a pretty big personality like Darrell Wallace Jr.'s uh, to kind of fill in the gaps being left behind by Jeff Gordon, Dale Jr., Tony Stewart, you know, people like that. And I think Darrell Wallace Jr. is the perfect fit for that. So I'm actually excited to see what he does next season and beyond. So anyway, before this episode runs too long, talking about predictions for this next upcoming round. The round of eight now has Martin Truex Jr., Kyle Busch, Brad Keselowski, Kevin Harvick, off the top of my head, Jimmy Johnson, Denny Hamlin, Ryan Blaney, and Chase Elliott. And we've got three pretty different tracks. We've got Martinsville, the tiny little flat paperclip, Texas, the big mile and a half speedway, and Phoenix, which is a more methodical mile racetrack, which is with an interesting backstretch. Three very different racetracks, should be three pretty entertaining races. But all that being said, who will be the four moving on to Homestead? Well, my bracket has definitely been broken. Coming into the playoffs, I had Kyle Busch, Kyle Larson, Martin Truex Jr., and Kevin Harvick as the four going on. Obviously, with Larson being out, that doesn't work anymore. But if I'm going to make my predictions now with who's going to be in, who's going to be out, uh, obviously I'm going to stick with Truex because like I said earlier, he's 52 points to the good already. He's already almost a lock. I'll put Kyle Busch in because while he had a rough day at Talladega, they've shown speed pretty much throughout these playoffs. I think they're still a top five car and he had a really good car for most of the race at Kansas. So I still have Kyle Busch moving on. I'm going to stick with Kevin Harvick. You know, he's been fairly quiet, but I feel like he's been better in these playoffs than he had been for a lot of the regular season. So I still have Harvick. Plus, we got Texas and Phoenix in this round. He's really great at Phoenix. But who takes that last spot, the one Larson had? Who is the new fourth guy in? And boy, I have a lot of people to choose from here. It's tough to not go Jimmy Johnson because we've got Martinsville in this round, which he's one of the best ever at. We've got Texas, which he probably is the best ever at. And then we got Phoenix, where he's no slouch either. It's hard to not pick Jimmy, but that team still has not had the speed. Even at Kansas, that was not typical 48 team stuff. They didn't execute. They didn't have great, great speed. They barely got in. I like Brad Keselowski, but I also don't really like Brad Keselowski, so I'm not going to go with them. So that leaves the two younger drivers, Blaney and Chase Elliott. I haven't talked much about Chase Elliott today, but he's been quietly consistent really through all the rounds so far. But I think what might do Chase Elliott in is the fact that he has little to no bonus points coming into this round. Doesn't have a win this year, has very few stage wins. I just don't think, I think he's got too much of a disadvantage here. So if you're going to ask me who gets that last spot, I'm going with 
Denny Hamlin. I haven't talked about Denny Hamlin yet either today. And that's kind of the way it's felt this whole playoffs. Denny Hamlin has two wins this year. He's been consistent in these playoffs, but very quietly consistent. Not drawing a lot of attentions, not leading a whole lot of laps, but he's consistently right there, especially at the end. Top 10, top 5. I think the 11 car sneaks in and makes three Toyotas at Homestead. Denny Hamlin's very good at Martinsville. He's been good at Texas and Phoenix in the past. Toyota's been very good on short tracks in recent years. Uh, I think Hamlin, they haven't made it very many mistakes this year, knock on wood. Uh, I think they make it to Homestead. Now, if you ask me, Truex is still the runaway pick for champion, but uh, we'll tackle that on a later date. Anyway, that is my show for today's episode. Gosh, I am very tired. I, I've been a little sick lately, but also ranting about Matt Kenseth. Uh, <coughs> didn't help. Thank you guys for watching so much. I hope you enjoyed. I uh, have new episodes up every Thursday, of course. I uh, appreciate all the support for this channel. Got a lot of stuff coming out soon, hopefully soon. Been super duper, super duper busy. Not having a lot of time to dedicate to YouTube, which is, you know, not the way I want it to be, but that's the way it is sometimes. Uh, but I got stuff coming out soon. Got this episode, this show coming out every Thursday, which I'm glad a lot of you guys seem to look forward to. Um, so we'll talk about Martinsville next week. I'm excited for Martinsville, one of my favorite racetracks. Uh, and then we'll preview Texas, you know, the huge. I'll be at the Texas Motor Speedway uh, in November, or in, you know, in a couple weeks. So uh, maybe you all see me there. Maybe uh, I'll do an episode, like, on location. Uh, that might be a lot of work. I have to bring, like, a camera crew. But anyway, yeah, that's going to be happening. So that should be an interesting episode. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode. I'll talk to you guys later. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Thursday. Goodbye.